Okay, we're going to start the uh, afternoon session. Uh, I'll start with a few uh, housekeeping notes, uh, just because we had a few questions here and there about certain things. First of all, there might be a little bit of confusion in the, uh, the general structure of this event and you've been hosted on campus, I think just because the emails might say some contradictory things. But uh, just to be clear that uh, the daily routine is, I think you actually come to expect, you can arrive here from around about 8.30, there'll be pastries, quote, breakfast provided. I'm, so, I'm sorry it's so poultry, but some pastries and some coffee. And um, we start the day at nine, and then we continue for three hours in the morning until 12. We have our lunch break for roughly an hour. Uh, and during the afternoon we go for another, so I'm about to go for another three hour session there should be someone coming around with coffee at some stage. Uh, and by the way, when you're doing like a practical thing, feel free to get up and get some coffee. I'll try to do regular breaks because it's a long session, but um, you know, you're free to move, you're free to move about the cabin, so to speak. Um, after this event, we're going to our welcome dinner, which will be the only dinner that we provide separate from the accommodation services. Uh, Though, and the reason why I mention this is purely because I don't want immediately after my session ends for, for you to all run out because we're all going to walk there together and in the 100 degree heat. So it's going to be a big trek through the, uh, the Davis Desert. Um, oh, uh, people were asking about water. Uh, we should have thought of water. Uh, well, Jason did at least. So there's cups there and there's a water dispenser in the kitchen. Uh, if you take one of our plastic cups, like write your name on it or something and keep it, you can keep it in this room or wherever, just because there's a limited amount of cups, we don't want to waste too many of them. Yeah, whatever, yeah. Uh, or bring a water bottle and fill up with water. Anyway, there's water dispense in the kitchen, there's, there's some plastic cups there. Um, I think that's it. Is, is there any really, uh, just because I'm the person who kind of organized the accommodation on campus and organized the catering, is there any like admin questions to do with that? Everyone kind of understands? Yeah? I don't think so because we kind of made a deal with the catering that we would be catered here and not back at the dining room services. Um, so I'm afraid it's here, breakfast, lunch, and then you have dinner back at the catering services. Um, Everyone's kind of okay. Everyone who's supposed to be checked in is checked in. Okay. If not, if you have any grievance, you can come and talk to me. I'm the person who's mostly in contact with these people. Uh, was there any other admin thing, Jason, you wanted to mention? Okay. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, just, just that. Oh, every single day we end roughly at four. And apart from today, you're pretty much free to do whatever you want after four o'clock after the session ends. But uh, this afternoon we're going to... Thursday we have bowling at seven, which should be fun, but yes. Okay, um, so to get back to the technical things, and uh, I'm gonna talk about the Gemfly Standard Library. Um, it's something that's relatively close to my heart because I develop a lot of the code here. Uh, it's a relatively newer part of Gem5. I think it's only been in for a year or a year and a half, I think, but I believe it can really help you uh, improve the user experience of using Gem5 and make things considerably easier. And I want to tell you how you can run your own simulations using it. And I hope you realize by the end, it's a lot more intuitive uh, to using the library. Because the library, library provides a lot of features that will be are very much of use when you're running a Gem5 simulation. So jump in, what's the starting library for? Well, Gem5 is just a simulator. You can use Gem5 to simulate almost anything. I mean Theoretically, you could use Gem5 to simulate, like, not even a, a computer system. You could use it to simulate almost anything. It is just a simulation model, and you have to. And with that, you just have to define your simulation and run it. So, I would say without the standard library, you have to provide a config file for Gem5, and that config file has to define pretty much every single part of your system, right? talking about hundreds of Python. So it's an effort. And if you get one of those lines wrong, you can be left with a very unhelpful error of what you've actually done, done, done incorrectly. So the Saturn library was built for users to quickly create systems with pre-built components. 
and kind of connect them together in a modular, modular way. Like a modular, so you can swap components in and out of, 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 uh, of a design, and behind the scenes, the Gem5 standard library will ensure that they're connected in a logical way to the system. Don't worry, we're gonna go, we're, I'm definitely gonna dive into some examples. It'll not be a three hour lecture. This is actually gonna be three hours of you mostly coding, but I'm getting kind of all the theory out of the way at the start here. So I want you to get in tune with this modular metaphor that is used quite a lot throughout the standard library, right? So at the core of any kind of standard library, sim standard library simulation, you have a board. So. Kind of like pretty much the board that you're all familiar with. And what's really, really nice about these types of boards, uh, I know I'm talking to a group of nerds, so I don't think I need to explain too much. The really fun thing is you can, the components on this board are modular to a certain extent. Um, if I want to do different RAM memory system, I can just pop these out and put a new stick of RAM in there, set my memory system. Similar to an extent with the processor, pop out the processor, put a new one in, and if the engineers have done their job correctly, this will, the, your, your system will boot, and the only difference will be that component has changed, made it faster, made it slower, I don't know. So that's just kind of the inspiration for the standard library. It should be easy to build simulations as if you're building a computer from the board up. There's some caveats to that, but that's pretty much it. So center of the Gen5 standard library is the board, and you plug things into this board and set up your simulation. So at the core, I would say, is the default position on this. You import your board, and it's probably going to ask for three things, pretty much all the time. What memory system are you going to use? So for example, we could get, say, oh, a DDR3-1600 memory system. A single, or I want a dual channel. You can swap these in and out. Another thing it typically asks for is what processor are you using. We'll go into more details about what type of processor Gen5 standard library offers. But again, you can swap in and out which processor you're using and start to run your simulation. And then also, because this is such a big thing in computer architecture, we have a component which is the for this for the. I just say the definition of our definition between the memory system and the processor. So it also include other sorts of caches and things you've got between there. But basically, your cache hierarchy is the definition of how your processor connects. Plug it to memory if you want to uh, uh, to a system that has no cache caches at all. Uh, very primitive. So if you get kind of familiar with this, just keep in mind it's modular. It's like building your own computer. And that's, and you're going to build your own computer in a simulated space very soon. Uh, I'll get back to this, but just so like I don't bombard you with it at the end, is uh, this is basically a kind of slightly trimmed tra class diagram of how things work in a standard library. And what I kind of want you to just take away here is there's an abstract board and then we have implementations of the board. So if you go down the left-hand side here, you get to an x86 board. So if you want to make an x86 simulation, you'll instantiate the x86 board. And then the abs any, uh, anything that instantiates the abstract board takes on a processor, memory system, and cache hierarchy. So an example of an abstract processor is what we call a simple processor. And or an abstract memory system, we take a single channel DDR3-1600. These are just examples. And a cache hierarchy. Uh, for example, a private L1, private L2 cache hierarchy. So this is, it's all, what I'm really trying to get across in this, kite, in this slide, if you remember from Hua's introduction, this is all, this is all an object-oriented design. Um, this is all like classes inheriting from other classes, and given that a lot of these are abstract, there's uh, an abstract uh, means that you have to define some things. So um, a typical one will be, um, What's a good example? Uh, in the, you know, you, in the uh, memory system, you have this abstract method that defines exactly how your memory system connects to the board. So you have to, in, so when you create your own 
um, component in the standard library, you need to ensure that abstract method has uh, got a concrete, concrete instantiation. So I'm gonna jump around, but what I want to talk to you is briefly about the directory structure of the standard library and how that relates back to imports. So um, I'm gonna, what's, how do I jump around on this computer? Uh, Alt, -tab. Alt tab. Cool. Uh, where are we, yeah. So, one second while I, okay, that, was, that just froze for a bit, okay. Um, I really just want to show you, the reason why I want to show you the directory structure of the standard library before I jump into anything is really, Germ5 is one of these projects where sometimes looking at the source code and knowing where it is can really help you actually deal with the tool. And we're gonna jump around and stuff. I'm gonna provide most of the imports for you inside the uh, examples we're gonna run, but I just want you to know where everything lives. So you go to Germ5, and then you go down to um, source, SRC, and then again, down to Python. This little directory here called Gem5 contains all the Gem5 uh, code. So probably the most interesting thing here for you is the components. So these are the things that we provide as part of this Gem5 standard library to, to build your designs with. So we have boards. Uh, so let's see an example. So we have a, an ARM board. Uh, this, this allows you to run ARM simulations. Um, they'll sneak peek ahead, here's the ARM constructor, so the ARM constructor takes a uh, processor, memory system, cache hierarchy, and you can also uh, define your platform and the ARM release that you want to target. Um, RISC-V board, so here's the RISC-V board. Uh, it, takes a, it just takes a mem pro processor, memory, and cache hierarchy. Uh, we have a test board that just allows you to run some tests. Uh, XA6 board allows you to run XA6 simulations. So keep in mind that like, you know, Python, Gem5. So if we want to import, for instance, x86 board, we do from gem5.components.boards.x86 board import x86 board, you know? So this will become slightly clearer when we get into examples. Uh, and just to briefly go around the other components here, cache hierarchy, so we can go classic cache hierarchy and see that we have a no cache, which is no caches. Uh, private L1 cache and a private L1, L2 cache. We are, we are trying to build more, com more components, uh, but for the last two releases, we've really been focusing on the infrastructure of this uh, library. So this is where everything lives, and please feel the need to jump around here and look at the source of these things. It's gonna be really helpful when you start to code up your own things, seeing how the source, how we built things in the library to understand how they work. So. Yes, so if you create a new, I think we a, a new cache hierarchy in the standard library, it'd be great if you can contribute, if you, if great, you could add that to the project. We're gonna go over how to make contributions to Gen 5 on Friday morning, uh, you know, how you uh, push a patch to Garrett and how you uh, eventually get this thing in the main line. Um, but yes, so going, Keep losing my mouse. Where is it? Is it off screen? I hear it. Oh, it's not. I did. Oh, it's okay. Um, no, I lost it again. It's a bug. No, no, every time I scroll up, it just disappears. Okay. Sorry, go back to wallet. Oh, okay. Okay, oh, okay. Uh, and uh, the reason, one of the things that's probably most important is obviously to use these components, you need to import them in Python. And this is kind of how you import it. So again, I kind of went over this. You want to import the simple board you would do from, com from gem5.components.boards.simpleboard, import simpleboard. 
Okay, that's the kind of how you import things going forward. I'll provide a lot of this for you, but I think it's really important that you understand the directory structure and things like this. So, I've done talking about my theories and all the stuff and why I built this. Uh, let's get started with an example. So, in your, uh, in your code spaces, could you go to that directory? I think that's still correct. Materials, using Gen5, 0 to std lib, and the, hello, and the hello world. And this is what you should see, seven lines of imports. Because I provided that for you. Uh, here. So I'm gonna go here. And what I'm gonna do is we're gonna code up a very simple, code up a very simple, um, Gem5 Sign Library simulation, which will run a binary that prints Hello World in x86. So materials using Gem5, 0, 02, and Hello World.py. Okay, let me just jump forward to my notes here so I can see what we're going to do. Right. First thing I want you to do is define your cache hierarchy. Cache. Get used to spelling mistakes and typos. There's going to be a lot of them. And in this, I'm just going to say, I don't want a cache in my system right now. So I'm just going to say my cache hierarchy is no cache. And you can see that from the imports. We've already imported no cache, so that's what we're using there. My memory, I'm going to do memory equals, I do a single channel DDR3 1600. It's going to auto complete that for me. And here it takes in one parameter, and that's the memory, the size of the memory system. And I'm going to say, uh, I want it to be one, oop, no, exclamation point, one gigabyte. Okay? Please, uh, I really do emphasize if you've got any questions or concerns or you're really getting confused to speak up or raise your hand or something. But, yeah? Can you make the font bigger? Can I make the font bigger? What's the, what's the font increase button? Control shift B. P, oh sorry, P. Give me one more time. Is that getting bigger? Uh, okay, that oh, was getting bigger. Is that big enough? Can everyone kind of read that? I can make it, I'll, I can see some people at the back squinting, so I'm gonna, maybe one more time and that's it. Okay, I lose some, I'm about to make it smaller, but. Okay. And next part, so now we've done our cache hierarchy and our memory, you remember there's one other component that a board needs to be able to run a simulation and that's a processor. So I'm gonna do processor equals, I'm gonna do a simple processor if you can't see exactly what I'm typing, it's, it's, it's what we imported there, the simple processor. I'm gonna say a CPU type I wanna use. So CPU type equals CPU types, so that's an enum. I'm gonna set it to uh, timing. And then I'm gonna do num, cor num underscore cores equals one. So I really hope that's intuitive what I've just set up. I set up a single core processor that has one timing CPU core. Okay, does anyone have any questions about that part or is it all very straightforward? Yes? Yeah, it's like a one GIB memory in your simulation? Oh, you mean, what, sorry, if you put one GB. 
Oh, um, I think by default we're always power of two in Gen 5, regardless of what you type in. I can't remember exactly how we. Some sizes are power of two, some things are power of ten, so it can be confusing. But we encourage people to use odd. Yes. So I use I to be clear, this is exactly what I mean. I don't have a, I don't actually know what it would do if I didn't have the I. Would it be the same? Yeah. So, yeah. If you, yeah. So now we're going to set up our board. So I'm going to do board equals simple board. So a simple board allows us to run Sys, uh, Gen 5 in syscall emulation mode, which is a very simple mode. It's like running things in bare metal. Uh, first thing we actually do here is set up the clock frequency. So cl clock rec. I wish you had autocomplete here, that would be really helpful, but it wasn't technically feasible when we did this. So I'm going to say a three gigahertz clock frequency on this board. That's CLK underscore rec uh, F R E Q. And then I'm going to do process, and I'm gonna, then I'm literally just going to dump in my stuff here. So I'm going to do processor equals processor. Yes, I like to explicitly declare my. Um, parameters. Uh, I'm going to do memory equals memory. And then I'm going to do cache hierarchy equals cache hierarchy. And I'm going to make sure this is on one line. It's all, this is all visible, so I'm going to Yes? Right now, in the Gen 5 standard library, all your processor cores are of the same frequency. Uh, hopefully, we can do something about that going forward. Um, also, another kind of follow on from that is can different cores in your processor have um, different types? Like, what, what, like, like, one can be a timing core, one can be an atomic core, or whatever. Um, the answer is right now no, but we are working on it. Yeah. Um, the standard, standard library is only um, a year old, so we still got a lot of feature requests. So I'm going to, has everyone kind of typed that in? And if not, look the guy, look the person next to you and copy their stuff. Because I just want to say at this point, there's some stuff that's going to come after this, but at this point, you've pretty much defined your hardware of your simulation. Right, that's it. You've defined simulation you're going to run from a hardware perspective. Now I'm going to go into really how you define what you're going to run in your simulation, how your simulation is going to run over the next 20 minutes. So I'm going to jump back to my slides. I'll tab. Back to my slides. So I went to so. You have your hardware, what do you want to run on it? Well, up until maybe a couple of years ago, uh, we would say you have to go find your own resources to run inside your own simulations. That's kind of our responsibility. Uh, but that's actually kind of unhelpful because building a disk image to run on Gen 5 or a binary to run on Gen 5 can be kind of a pain. So we came, we came up with Gen 5 resources. And Gen 5 resources is basically a repository of resources uh, that run in Gen 5. What I mean by a resource is basically anything you can uh, put inside your simulation, such as a kernel, a disk image, a binary, a workload. So for instance, uh, we have the uh, NAS parallel benchmark suite is like a resource you can plug in, uh, the Linux kernel, uh, various versions of the Ubuntu operating system. Uh, we're still working to expand these. Most of them are for x86, though we have some RISC-V and some ARM stuff as well. Um, and we hope to expand this more in the future. Uh, it kind of comes, I see it as kind of having two sides of it. We have the sources inside the Gen5 resources repository. So if you're using a Gen5 resource, you can hopefully go into that repository and see how we built it. So for instance, if you've got a, um, a GAPS 
uh, benchmark disk image, you can go into Gemfire Resources and build that, Gemfire Resources source and build that yourself if you want with slightly different parameters. But we also provide the pre-built as well. Those are hosted in our Google Cloud. Tiny little problem with Gen5 resources is, well, no, it's actually a problem with uh, us in the Gen5 project. None of us are really web developers, so we never really got around to building a good website for Gen5 resources that lists everything that we have. So the most up-to-date uh, uh, place you can see where all the resources are is literally this JSON file that's very machine-readable but has everything inside it at this URL here. Uh, we hope over the next year to actually produce a website that lists all the resources in a more human readable format. But right now, we just pass around this kind of JSON resources file. And the, standard, and the fun thing is, each resource has an ID. And if you have the ID and give that to the standard library, the standard library will download that resource automatically to your system. And if you already have it on your system, it'll just use that. So it's kind of like a caching system. Like you download it, it's cached on your system, and then you'll, you, you, you don't have to download it again. So that's kind of fun and clever. And if all that didn't make much sense to you, don't worry, we're gonna jump into some examples of using this. And this, I just wanna say, this is roughly what the Gem5 resources uh, looks like. Uh, I mean, the JSON file. So this is like an entry in that JSON file of a particular resource. This is the RISC-V disk image resource. And it says, this is a simple RISC-V disk image based on BusyBox for the RISC-V architecture. And then some basically data that helps the standard library process it. Like, oh, this is a zipped file. This is the MD5 sum. This is the URL you can find it. And here's the sources for it. So um, I'm not gonna go off my slides. So if you all go and, go and find this file inside your thing, materials using Gem5, 02 standard library, obtaining resources.py. You should see this. It's three lines. The first line just imports the resource uh, class. Um, second line, you're defining what resource you want. So in this case, you're saying the uh, RISC-V disk image. RISC-V disk image. Uh, and then all we're doing here is printing where that is on your system. Um, and then you can run this command. So please, like, run this command and kind of see what happens in the terminal. Gem5 x86, materials, using Gem5, zero to standard library, obtaining resources. And this is just obtaining that resource for you. Uh, yeah, tell me if you have any problems or anything like that. If you run that, you should see something like this. Uh, so it's kind of interesting to read, like, just to see the log here of what happened. Uh, first line, it's saying, I couldn't find this resource locally, so I'm downloading it to this location. Uh, and then it says, finish downloading, and it says, well, this is a compressed file, so I'm going to decompress it, and it decompresses it. And then it prints out where the resources were uh, I, where it downloaded the resources in your system. Um, and if you run this again, it doesn't have any of those lines because you've already downloaded it to your system. It loads the cache. It doesn't download it a second time. So, so any questions about Gem5 resources? Like this kind of theory that we're downloading this from a repository somewhere up on the cloud and you can, we're gonna show how you integrate this into your Um, if so, I'll move on to, uh, let's see. Well, of course, I just wanna, we'll, we'll get to this more in an example later on in the tutorial. But you don't have to use our resources if you don't want to. There's many reasons you might not want to, like we don't provide the resources you actually need. So you can use a custom resource inside your simulations. And this is just an example of a custom resource. It's the same as resource, except it's custom resource, and then you specify the path in your system. This will become clearer how to use this in a bit. I'm gonna have you use a custom resource inside your simulations, but um, we'll get to that part. So I'm gonna already kind of give you a sneak peek of what I'm gonna show you to do, but let's just jump back to our code here. So I want you 
to say, we want a binary. And that's going to be a resource. And that resource's name is going to be x86 dash hello64 dash static. So I think you can all imagine what this binary is. It's an x86 binary, 64-bit, uh, statically linked, that prints hello world. It's a really, really basic binary here. And then what we do, board dot set underscore se underscore work uh, binary, and then work binary workload, that auto completed for me, that's nice. And then we're gonna set that binary here. And that's you set your workload for that board. So remember, so and this, I wanna say that this here, set, EC, set SE binary workload, this is saying we're gonna run in SE mode. This automatically sets up SE mode for us. So if you remember from the introduction, and I don't blame you if you didn't, because that was a giant information dump, SE work mode is kinda bare metal-esque, and it, but it does a lot of tricks. It does things, it's called syscall emulation mode, so what it does is it uses your um, systems syscalls, your host system, like this, to run the syscalls inside a binary and tries to basically simulate mostly everything else within the Gen5 simulator. So it's a bit of a hack, but it's pretty useful if you just want to run a very simple binary like this. So next thing we're going to do, so we've defined our hardware, we've defined our software, let's get running. How do you run this simulation? Well, I like to do simulate or simulator equals simulator. And then board equals board. So this is saying we're gonna run a simulation inside this simulator module. So simula I'll go, I'm gonna talk more about the simulator module later, but the simulator module is what handles the Gen 5 simulation. And we're saying, hey, we wanna run a simulation with this board that we've just created here. Let me do simulator dot run. Okay. Um, and also, never make a mistake that I always make and forget to actually save your, save the file. Because I, sometimes I run the file, I just type it out like this, and I don't understand the errors I'm seeing, and I realize it's because I've not saved it. So remember to control S and save the file. So if you open the terminal, and if you don't know how to open the terminal here, it's terminal, new terminal. Gem5, x86, and then literally that file you just made, so that's materials, using Gem5, 02 std lib, hello world, and then you hit return, and please say this works. Yeah, thank God that there's no typos in my example. Um, see, for some of you, this might be your first ever Gem5 simulation. So, little hello world here shows that you've completely run the simulation. Did everyone get this far? Everyone's here? Getting there? Because we're gonna expa expand this example, so we're not just gonna throw it away, we're gonna expand a bit in this example. Does anyone at this point have any questions? Because you've just built your first simulation using the standard library. Yeah, I really need this to have worked. Uh, someone's going to raise their hand. I really need this to have worked because we're going to move on and start to do some experiments with this. Little, little experiments, but just kind of proof of concept. Um, so I really want you to all be up to speed with this. Okay. What did I say at the beginning of this, right at the start? Standard library is modular. You can take components out and replace them with other components just like our board. So, what I'm gonna show you how to do now is you're going to take, out, you're gonna basically add a cache hierarchy, cache hierarchy to the system, right? See here, no cache. We're saying there's no cache hierarchy in the system. 
it's like a null. It's like there's nothing there. The processor connects directly, directly to memory, straight to memory. Um, so we're going to add a cache hierarchy. So the first thing I'm going to do is import the cache hierarchy one, and I think I'm going to do a private L1, private L2 cache hierarchy. So up at the top of your file, any, anywhere really, it doesn't matter too much, from gem 5 dot components dot cache hierarchies dot classic, it's, it's there long, and from classic you do private L1, private L2 cache hierarchy, and then import, again, long, private L1, private L2 cache hierarchy. I'm going to screw myself over and copy and paste that. Put that here. So my paste didn't work there. Okay, I'm just going to type that in. Something weird is going on. Private L1, private L2. Okay, we're not quite done yet. Because we need to add some parameters. And this is very small. I'm just going to remind myself what it is. So there's basically three parameters to define for the private L1, private L2. L1 D size, which we can set to, I guess, 32. Gonna, what did I set to in my example to keep it consistent? 32 kilobytes. So that's the L1 data cache size we just set. Then we set the L1 information cache size. I'll set that to 62 kilobytes as well. Sorry, sorry, I'll set that to 32 kilobytes as well. And finally, the L2 size. And I'll set that to 64. And that's it. You've just replaced, you just, mod you just modified your system to have a cache, hierarchy, a cache hierarchy of any sort in it, but specifically a private L1, private L2 cache hierarchy of these sizes. And you can just press up on your terminal and run this again. I really hope this works because I hate when I have live typos. No, see, it worked. So, sorry, I'm just going to remind myself. Okay. So, if we want to see what impact the cache hierarchy had, we can go to the M5 out directory here and go to stats. And let's go with, um, oh, this is truncated a bit, but you can see that the number of simulated seconds this took was 0 0.00459. Um, yeah. Uh, or, or that. So I probably should have done this. I may have done this slightly the wrong way around, but you can see how you can see the time here that it took 0 0.0049. And if we go back, something's stopping you. Going back, commenting out these lines here, if you wish. I'm plugging in no cache here. Saving it, running it again. Did I, did I, why did that not update? I didn't save it? Okay, yeah, just no one warned me that thing I just said you always have to do. Okay, so this is the time with no cache. I really hope this works now that I've embarrassed myself. Control S, run it, 
please work. Seem to work. Yeah, and now it's a lower simulated time because you got cash. You got a cache in this system. Of course, it's going to run faster. Great. Uh, I did go through that rather quickly. Um, does anyone have any questions or anything? Because I'm going to, let's see. I think now would be an okay time if anyone wants to grab coffee because I'm about to jump into from this into full system simulation. I know there's some people asking me about coffee earlier, so feel free to have some coffee and there's little donut things there or something. Yeah. Snacks. And uh, yeah, if anyone needs to help with that first half, they haven't feel like, just raise your hand. Oh, you mean the stats? Uh, these all just mean different things. In sense, sim seconds is like, it's in theory, how fast your your workload ran. So uh, that's what I was really. But yeah. Code tries to get smart yeah. and does the imports that are not from Gen 5. Yeah. Like this is the issue that some people were running okay. into. Like when you're running, you might want to attention a like yeah. double check where it works. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's. Um, so a dot is just a file for it. We're about to start uh, the next part. So what I showed you in that first little part there was, um, as you can see, like a very, very simple simulation. You've just built a board that runs an x86 binary. And even then, it has to be a very simple binary because there's no operating system there. There's really no advanced features in that board at all. It's called a simple board for a reason. So this, in this second bit, I'm going to have you take kind of what you've learned and take it a little bit further to build an x86 full system simulation. And by the end of this, you will have a board, an environment, a script, and run, will boot uh, a complete Ubuntu boot right up to user login, and um, I'll also incorporate some other Gen5 library features and hopefully get you using them in the wild. So first thing I want you to do is just open up the material 02 standard library x86 full system.py file and I've just for you to save you all the effort I inclu I've included all the includes we're going to use in this because they're the biggest pain to incorporate uh, so that's all there for you and we're going to it's going to be a very coding intense like it so please bear with me I'm, I'm going to type along with you so oops. so if we go to where we need to be, 0 2, x 6 full system. Yeah. Yes, I just want to mention now if you get really, really stuck on anything in this tutorial, like your script just will not work and you're too embarrassed to say anything to anyone, if you do zero, if you look in 0 2 selib complete, all the answers are there, okay? Like I've literally provided the full scripts. Uh, I verified they work. You know, you're all honest students. I, I mean, I, I think. So, you know, I, I don't, uh, maybe not too much copy and pasting, but you know, it does help to have like the proper solution if you really feel like you're being stupid. Um, which, trust me, I look up other people's Gen 5 scripts all the time to see why I'm being stupid. So don't feel too bad about it. Um, so yeah, just wanted to mention that, but we're going to go ahead and code this anyway because I think if you go line by line and you're all typing it out, you can help understand things a lot better. So the first thing I'm going to introduce is optional, but I find it really helps, um, is, the, is the requires function. So you want to do requires, and what this function does is you can specify things that the Gen5 binary you're going to run this with and the environment and the, desk, the machine you're running Gen5 on have the properties you need to run this simulation. So hopefully this becomes clearer. I'm going to do ISA required 
equals I say dot dot x86. So I'm saying the Jamfile binary that you uh, you ex you execute this script with has to be compiled to has to include the x86 ISA. And people ask like, what, Bobby? Why? What's the point in this check? It because if you don't have this check and you run this with say a binary that only contains ARM, it's just going to fail in this catastrophic way that it's very very hard to understand. Whereas if you run if you have this line here and you run it with ARM ISA, it's going to print out a very obvious error that goes, hey, you're running this with the wrong binary. It's just something, it's just a safety. So uh, that's, that's why it's optional, it's a safety. And in a similar vein, um, we haven't talked much about this in so far, but every Gen5 binary has a different coherence protocol inside of it. So I also want to define what coherence protocol the binary should have. I'm saying coherence protocol equals, uh, sorry, and then it's another enum, so it's coherence protocol dot, and then I'm going to do mess, it's messy two level you want. So similar as before, I'm saying just a, a check before we st literally do anything in the script is, are you running this on with the correct binary? It has to have these two things in it as a requirement, okay? Now, it kind of starts to look, you're gonna have deja vu over the next few lines because we kind of do the same thing as before. So I'm gonna kind of go through this, but the first thing we want to do is define, is put in our cache hierarchy. And what cache hierarchy are we using this? Well, I gave you a hint, it's the messy two level. So it's this one here, what we've imported up above here. And we'll learn more about this earlier in the week, this is a Ruby cache protocol which are slightly more fun, but difficult. Um, and it's got quite a lot of parameters, but we'll just go through them all. It, you need to specify the L1D cut size. That's very similar to our first one. Let's set that to, 30 to 32 kilobytes again. We'll specify the L1I cut size. Again, when in doubt, do 32 kilobytes. Specify the, uh, sorry, that's, oh no, I was right. Um, you wanna specify the associativity, am I saying that right, Jason, of the um, L1 decash, uh, what's it, asos? Oh, uh, yeah, it's, dou it's double S, yeah, uh, it's os equals eight, the L1 I osos, and I'm going to say that's eight as well. And then we finally set the L2 size. And in my example I've got in front of me, I set this quite big, so why not? 256 KIB. And the L2 sos uh, at 16. And the number of L2 banks. Equals one. So that's exhausting, but these are the parameters that this needs to set up your uh, messy two level cache hierarchy. Oh yes, yeah. Thank you, that, would just, that saved me a bug. Um, double check, I've got all those parameters correct, so my example works as I want it to. Yep, uh, two things. Oh, it's L2 bank, yeah, it's sure. Cool, thank you for keeping me on my toes. Um, and I'm, the memory system, there's nothing funny about this memory system, it's exactly the same as we did before, we're just gonna do a single channel DDR3-1600, and I'm gonna set, just for the sake of interesting, we're gonna set that to two gigabytes this time. Okay, I'll give, I'll give people a minute until I stop hearing typing, but hope you can kind of see like the obvious patterns here, even though we're doing a slightly more complex simulation, 
Do you still have the set, set your cache hierarchy? Do you still have the What comes next? Processor. So processor, we're going to do something a little fun that we're going to go back to a little bit later on. But we're we'll do processor equals simple switchable processor. I'll explain what these parameters mean in just a bit. Starting core type equals CPU types dot let's do timing and switch core type CPU types dot O three. I'm gonna do two cores this time, so num cores equals two. Okay, just, just for my own amusement, can anyone give any idea of what this processor might do or does or yeah, go ahead. Exactly right. Uh, so just to repeat what he said, uh, it, as, Jace, as anyone who's used Gen5 knows, it runs really, really slow, and often at the beginning of your simulation, there's stuff that you just don't want, don't really need to simulate, only in the sense that it's necessary to reach the point in the program you do want to simulate. So the switchable processor allows you to start with a CPU core which is more, which is fast, but less, uh, less accurate. So you're not gonna get really, well, timing, the timing core is pretty good, but it's not nearly as detailed as the O3 CPU, but the O3 CPU takes forever to run. So the idea here is you run your simulation using the timing CPU up to a certain point, you switch out the cores and get to your more accurate or desired model, in this case, out of order model, and then you run the simulation from then on in O3 mode. So I'm gonna, this, don't, don't type this line, but I'm just showing you that eventually we're just gonna do something like this in our code. We're gonna do processor dot uh, switch and that's the point at which we switch the cores. That's the call to the processor. Hey, now is the time to switch your cores. Yeah. No. Uh, Atomic is faster, but it doesn't really have any useful timing information, so it's no good. I, do, I don't really know why I use timing in this example. Maybe there was a reason, but. Oh yeah, Atomic doesn't work with Ruby. That's why. That's why I use timing. Yes, there is some, some stuff doesn't work with other stuff. So the reason I use timing is we're using a Ruby cache coherence protocol. I um, use a timing process, processor for that. Um, so you can honestly probably f type this in your sleep by now, but we're gonna set up the board. The only difference here is using the x86 board. Exactly the same as before. Clock frequency. Set that to three gigahertz. And then processor, it's processor, memory, it's memory, and cache hierarchy equals cache hierarchy. So the x86 board is used for running x86 simulations. It has all the components on it that are needed by x86 binaries to basically work. Um, yeah, the boards typically are tied to ISA targets just because every ISA has its own little funny little things that need to be handled correctly. Okay, how best to do this next part? I think I'm just gonna get you to type, type it out and be confused until I explain it to you, okay? <laughs> so I want you to write, uh, the first line I'm gonna write here is actually a command I want you to run once this operating system is booted, okay? And I want you to run uh, M5 exit colon, and I'm gonna do a new, no, let's do sorry, col semicolon. I mean, echo 
Let's see, echo, uh, switching cores. Oh, this is, no, let's do, this is running in 03. Semicolon, sleep for one second, sleep one, and then M5, exit. So I'm this is the command we're going to run. Maybe you don't understand it, particularly the M5 exit parts. But I hope you can see the functionality of this between the M5 exits is printing something to the terminal, which is saying this is running in 03, and sleep for a second before continuing. And then we're going to set our workload, which is going to be inclusive of this command. So board will set kernel disk workload. kernel equals a resource. So we have to specify the kernel we're going to use for this resource. Let me squint and see what the ID is. x86 dash Linux dash kernel dash 5.4.49. A single colon? Oh, yeah, no, that, that's that's mistake, thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, so you, in here, we're setting the kernel that we want to use for this full system simulation, uh, the Linux kernel for x86, 5.4.49. And then the disk image we want to use, give me another resource. So what we're going to use here is x86 dash Ubuntu 18.04 image. So this is a disk image that contains Ubuntu 18.04. And then read file. Contents, sorry, read file contents equals command. So this set, so basically, I won't go into this in too much detail, but when that disk image inside this disk image is basically a script that when that when the Ubuntu operating system is fully booted, it runs this command called read file, and the read file will read in this command here and execute it. So this whole thing here, these one, two, three, four, five, six-ish lines, maybe you can just get that down to two if you really want it to be funny. Um, it's saying use the 5.4.49 Linux kernel with an x86 1804 disk image to run a boot, and once it's booted, run that script to the top there, which is gonna print something to the, to the command line. So to go back to our presentation, zoom slideshow. I'm gonna talk more about this command and how you handle it and how you handle the simulation. So you noticed in this command, you had these M5 exits inside the command. Does anyone know what they're for? What they're for is they're going to exit the simulation loop. So remember before when you run, when you run simulator.run and you run your simulation, and at some point it ends and returns you back to the Python? That's, that's what these do. So we call them exit events. In this example, there's two. There's one just before you execute the command and one just a after you execute the command. And the similar module is used to handle these events. It's gonna, uh, hopefully gonna become clearer, but don't worry. So this is kind of a diagram that I want to help you understand how this, how basically the Python configuration script and the simulation actually work together with these exit events. You set up your simulation, which is what you've just done in the Python script, and at some point you're gonna simulator.run. 
you're going to run your simulation. And that begins starting your workload right up until the first exit event. Once the exit event is triggered, you go back to your Python configuration script and you can do some, you can do stuff there, right? You can do whatever you want. In fact, you could just quit your simulation at that point if you wanted to. But then if you click simulator.run again, it will continue simulation from where you left off until another exit event is reached and then you return back. And you can do this endlessly. You could have 50, 100, a million exit events and they'll return you back and you can do something and you can jump straight back into the simulation again. Is anyone smart enough? No? Okay. Uh, this is where you can move, you can switch CPUs from something that is fast but not what you want to something that is slow but more detailed than actually what you want. So you run your workload, you put in your exit event inside your workload somewhere. Well, you put your exit event after you're done everything you don't want to simulate and right before something you do want to simulate. Runs up to that exit, it exits, you return to your script, and then you can do like and back in and run a more detailed simulation. Okay. So I want you to save your. Uh, you go, go ahead. What's it? It's gonna. So in this example, exit. Do whatever we want here. I mean, we could do nothing. We just run ru similar run again. And this, this command in the sleep would run here. Go down and exit. What do you mean by a fake workload? Like if you remove that workload. If you remove our, our, our command? Yeah, the sleep, just the one. If you echo, you immediately have time exit. Then you wouldn't sleep, you would just echo. I just put the sleep there because I just wanted the simulation to up just for a little bit so we could simulate something that was a little bit more meaningful. Well, not meaning, meaningful in terms of time. Uh, no, yeah, the only reason the sleep's there is just to slow down the simulation a bit and yeah. So I want you to save the file you have in front of you. We're absolutely gonna go back to it. But I want to jump a little bit into this example I've got set up into simulator use. So in uh, go to sclib, you have this simulator use file. And it's all written out for you, pretty much. We're gonna add a little bit on the end, but it's all pretty much there. And you can see it's very, very similar previously are using this custom resource, which is called M5X example. Okay, has everyone got that loaded up? Everyone see that in front of them? And please, like, don't feel free to say slow down or whatever. This is essentially, we've, we've got the source, you're more than free to look at it. It's inside the materials as well. But this is what this M5 example binary does. This is its source. It's it's uh, running a print, this program has started, set the exit event count to zero, and then it's got an infinite, infinite loop here. The first thing it does in this loop is increments the exit count. It does a print statement that says, I'm about to exit the simulation for the eighth time, and then it runs M5 exit, and then it just goes around and around forever. Uh, and you need to, uh, you're going to learn more about this in the coming days, but this include in this is necessary to get the M5 exit command inside a binary. So, this is what I want you to append at the end of this file. Just make the file look like this. Uh, print something like, we, we, well, you know, we print blah, 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 simulator don't run, and then run, just do, do, do simulator don't run a few times and run this happens. Do you understand? Like, see what happens if you just keep running the simulation dot run a few times at the end, then run the simulation and see what happens. And yeah, play around with it a bit and I'll give you like a minute to play with that. The one kind of thing that, you know, after it 
after you run, it's going to reach the next exit event, drop out, and you can do stuff there. You can do whatever you want. time explaining maybe I don't know why I they have please tell me but if you all understand that's great so I'm gonna just do this along with you because why not so simulator use I'm gonna do Echo, no, it's not echo, sorry, print. Hello. And then I'm going to simulator. So run. And I'm going to do print another print. Bye. And simulator. So run. And I'm going to save, save this as I almost forgot to do again. And I'm going to do gem5, xa6, materials, using gem5, or 2, simulator use. Uh oh, what do I do? Did this fail for anyone else? Yeah. Oh no, what do I do? Error, unique cache hierarchy. Why well, have it got a unique cache hierarchy in there? Oh, I didn't mean to include that. Okay. That. Thanks for uh, pointing out this bug to me. We can quickly fix it. Uh, why is there no cache hierarchy in the simulation? Okay, I don't know why this is. Okay. Let's go back to the other world and let's port no cache. So copy and paste that out. I guess this is uh, not a planned, but. Uh, so that, comment out this line, and put no cache here. That should do something. Okay, yeah. So if you replace that with no cache, you get something like this, which is exactly what I coded in. Uh, the first thing it does is it exits the simulation. So it runs. And then it says, I'm about to exit the simulation for the first time. And then I print hello. And then I run again. And the simulation continues. And the simulation goes, I'm about to, print, I'm about to exit event for the second time. And I print bye. And I run one more time. And I could continue doing that for infinity because the program is in an infinite loop. Um, I suppose at some point that exit count is going to <coughs> overflow, but uh, yeah. Anyone have any questions? This? Sorry? And yes, remember that no cache fix. Um, and you know, save the file. I don't know how that unique cache hierarchy got in there. I must have modified the wrong file at some point. Oh well. Okay. Um, has everyone kind of got this? working to a certain extent, or at least can understand it? Okay. Yeah. 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 No, no, that means so they, it runs, comp like the M5 exit is what forces this to stop. And you can go back here. Yeah. So it's, it's just run. It's just, the M5 exit is just being executed here, and then you run something. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, the M5 exit requires going to, like, 
No, no, the M5, if you look into the program, uh, the M5 exit is inside the source code. So when that is hit in the source code, it will exit this run. It will, it will force this to return, essentially. Yeah. So this is, I think you can all maybe get a grip of how this works, but it's actually kind of not the most intelligent way to manage your simulations, especially when you've got lots of different ex exit events and a complex simulation run. So I'm going to show you a way to do this a bit more intelligently using the simulator module. It involves Python generators. So <laughs> maybe some things you might understand this are rooted in the fact that not many people fully understand Python generators. But let's jump straight into this. So I'm just going to delete all this stuff I wrote here to play with. In fact, I'm going to delete, yeah, I'm just going to delete, mm, yeah, let's just delete all the way up to here. Because I'm going to, wait, we do need the board, actually. So board equals board. So we want to say on exit event. I want to make sure I'm doing this right. Yeah. Equals. I'm going to do, going to do a Python dictionary here, which is two curly brackets. Exit event dot exit. Now we're going to do, this is so small. OK, bear with me. There's going to be some magic happen here. Print statement. Be, I've been told to beware of Python autocomplete in this uh, environment because it can lead you astray. But for statement in. See, does stuff like that. Stop. Okay, so this looks complicated, but it's not too bad if you actually just break it down. We're saying when we construct the simulator, hey, I'm going to define for you what to do on these exit events. Uh, you know, I don't want to have to handle anything from here on. I want to click run and just have my simulation run without me having to really state anything further down the file. So we're saying on exit event of type exit, I'll talk briefly about these different types in a moment, you're going to say, the first time we meet an exit type exit event, I want you to print this first statement here. And the first statement is, just exit the first exit event. And then, pretty self explanatory from that on, the second time the exit event is hit, we're going to say, just exit the second exit event. And the third time, we just exit the third exit event. So this is a way of pre-programming the simulator, in a sense, to do certain things as exit events are Come up, in your, come up in your simulation. So this doesn't need to be a print. This could be a function here that you run each time, right? Just with different arguments. So imagine you've got function, um, for example, um, how, how, like, how, like how about you want to, on each exit event, you want to dump your statistics and copy your statistics file to some directory to save it for later. You would just create a function that's called like dump stats and move file. And then you would create this generator here that would pass in the right parameters to that function each and every time that exit event was reached. And uh, so let's kind of see how this code works. Again, pray to God I don't have any typos. 
Why did that? Oh, because I didn't do, okay, yes. And also you have to remember simulator.run. Otherwise it doesn't run at all. And Yeah, so I'm just going to, I'll put this down in a minute. I'm just going to show the output. Uh, the program has started, uh, and then you can see it, it did exactly as, as, as I predicted, and as we predicted. Uh, the program, the, but it's running in the simulation side, it's saying, I'm about to exit for the first time. Throws back to the Python level, and the Python is spinning out, I just exited the first exit event. Jumps back into the simulation. Simulation says, I'm about to exit for the second time. Jumps back. Flip, flop, flip, flop, with the correct print statement each time until finally reaching the end. Because essentially, once it comes out, once this is done, the simulator is going to go. We've got no more predefined things to do, so we're just going to exit without doing anything. And then that ends the simulation. Anyone have any questions about that? Because we're about to use this back in our full system example. So I want to make sure everyone is relatively hunky-dory. Yeah? Uh, this, this exit event should be, in, should be already included. Uh, it's uh, here. Be careful you haven't accidentally imported something else. Sometimes that happens with Python autocomplete. Oh, um, him, the per Purdue guy. <laughs> so I'll leave that up just for a second until I'm confident everyone's happy. Sorry, which part? Oh, the import? Are you sure this isn't imported already? Oh, okay. Um, I don't know why, but yeah. Okay, um, a quick question, yeah? Um, I mean, you can see it as, yeah, you can see it as a pause. It's a, we, we say we exit the simulation loop, but it's a safe exit. The state of the simulation is still maintained. So yeah, it's like pausing. It's like, yeah, you can see it as a pause while we jump back and do things inside our simulator. So I'm going to jump back to this. I think I'm going to think it's time to enough people have got it. And if you haven't got it, I am willing to help during a break. Or you can talk to your neighbor or flag down someone. Um, oh, OK, cool, great. That's what we just did. Uh, I want to have a disclaimer here. And we'll get more. Again, this is something that we're going to cover later on in the week. But I don't want to overwhelm you with too much information right now. Um, I've been cheeky and pretending there's like one kind of exit event. There's not. Uh, the, eg the exit event of type exit is just the most commonly used. But there are others, uh, other event types. Like, uh, for example, um, eg one at the bottom here, exit event max tick, means, uh, remember before how when you set up the simulator, you can say run to tick? 
Well, when that reached, it's going to return an exit event of max tick. And you can also do uh, exit event user interrupt. That essentially means this simulation has exited because someone did control C. Um, the two things I just want to emphasize here is, first of all, you can, you have to handle these, um, you can over, uh, first thing is, the simulator module would have sensible defaults for these. So for instance, and you can see them inside this file that you don't have to go to, but just like an FYI. So for instance, uh, work begin and work end are often used to um, sig uh, specify regions of interest within your program. So you say like, you know, I'm only interested in the statistics of this for loop. So you have M5 work begin and M5 work end to kind of capture that. And the M5 work begin stat command will actually, the, the, the simulator module will clear your statistics file, if, like reset everything to zero, and then to begin your new statistics run. And the M5 work end will dump the, dump the stats for you to a file. So there's default behavior for a lot of these exit events, but also the default behavior can be overridden whenever you want to do anything you want. They're just default behaviors. And I'm just gonna put this disclaimer here. I don't know why I put this slide here and not at the beginning, but anyway, the similar module is still kinda in beta, so everything I say here is subject to slight change because we're still trying to figure out how to do it. Just like an FYI, if like you work on Gen 5 two years down the line and some of this is a little bit outdated, it's very new, but it's still in beta. So I'm gonna go back to my our uh, full system simulation program. So if you could go navigate back to that, I'll try to find it as well. Yes, x86 full system. So given what we know, let's set up the simulator to when there's an exit event occurred in our program, we want to switch the CPU cores. Uh, I'm trying to do this without creating too much of a shadow. M5 exit is our first exit event. When that's triggered, switch the CPU cores out, the out of order CPU. This print statement's gonna be printed along with this sleep, saying this is running an O3 CPU. At a final M5 exit event, we're just gonna use that to complete our entire simulation so it doesn't run on forever. Okay, so let me code out this example. Uh, which I hope it makes sense to you. Simulator equals simulator. Board equals board. Here I want to, here I want on exit event and a map exit event dot exit colon I'm gonna say func this this will make sense soon for func in processor dot switch so you can kind of see the neatness here right we're saying hey hey no, he's saying, hey simulator, when you reach an exit event, for the first exit event, processor don't switch. On the second exit event, just don't do anything, just exit. Let me do simulator dot run. And once you finish typing out that, you have a complete end-to-end -end full system simulation inside the Gen5 standard library. Well, using the Gen5 standard library, I should say. I would love you to all to run this <laughs> right now, but it would literally take hours to complete, so there's really no point. But you can run Gen5 x86 and point on this file and see it start up and see like things happen on your screen um, if you want, and then control C to take it away. But um, yeah, that's um, 
that's building a full system simulation. Uh, does anyone have any questions? We're about to kind of move on to a lot more stuff in the last hour. Okay, you, do you want to, everyone, feel free to get up and stretch your legs because I'll take this opportunity to have a break. And uh, sorry, do you have a question? So the reason we don't use atomic in this example, at atomic is faster, yes. The reason we don't use atomic in the CPU is we're using the Ruby cache adherence protocols and they don't work with the atomic CPU. If you use classical clash, it should work, unless it's other, I think that should work, yeah. So uh, honestly, uh, what the example I'd really like to show you is using the KVM CPU, which allows you to use the kernel virtual machine which runs extremely fast because it's just running on your host machine. But uh, that doesn't work in code spaces because it requires a specific environment to work correctly. Um, but yes, yes, you're, you're essentially correct. Yeah. Um, I don't, yeah, you don't have to switch to CPUs. You can do whatever you want. You can uh, choose that point in your simulation to uh, dump the statistics, wipe the statistics. Um, you can do anything but really change the fundamental design of your simulation, because that's already embedded, but yeah. Okay, and um, we'll take um, te five, ten-ish minutes uh, before the final hour of uh, this tutorial, where I'm gonna get you to extend the library and create your own components. Okay, uh, everyone, uh, just get your seat, get seated for the next part, which is gonna be, um, well, oops, just jump through all these, okay. Extending the library. So, I've had a couple of people question this, and it's a really valid, I suppose it's a really valid criticism of the standard library right now is, we don't actually have that many models inside the standard library to use. We have maybe like four or five different cache hierarchy systems We've got like two processors. We have like a few memory systems that are all pretty much built off the same kind of standard template. So how would you extend the library for your own purposes? Like you want to experiment with them, so you need to create it to plug into a board. How would you go about doing that? Okay, what we're gonna do is talk through an example. First of all, very, very important you remember how the Gen5 library is structured behind the scenes in that if you want to create your own component, you have to extend from the correct, correct abstract class. So if you want to create a processor, you are extending abstract processor. You're saying like my processor, brackets, abstract processor, you're extending it and implementing the abstract functions. And when you do, you can plug it into your simulation as you would any other Gen5 component. Similarly with the memory system and abstract cache hierarchy, similarly with the boards, which admittedly are a lot more complex, but yes, you can create your own board if you want to do a specific thing. So I'm just gonna jump straight into it, but I need you to open up uh, materials using Gem5, 0 to unique cache hierarchy, unique cache hierarchy.py, right? So we're gonna create our unique cache hierarchy, um, and you should have uh, a constructor and three uh, methods, uh, sorry, three functions that just are passing them. Those are the abstract functions we're gonna, we have to uh, declare in order to use this in our simulations. So we're creating a new classic cache hierarchy for the Gen5 standard library. Uh, let's look at, grab my notes. So let's, in front of you, jump back to this, uh, unique cache hierarchy, unique cache hierarchy. Got this in front of us. Oh, and I haven't got a net in front of me. I'll go back and complete that. Let's start with this, the constructor. So we're gonna say we, we have to, dis we have to if anyone knows anything about object oriented design, you have to instantiate your uh, superclass first. Init. 
itself. And then, so the first thing we're going to do in this constructor is this design needs a memory bus. So we're going to do self dot mem bus equals system crossbar and a width of 64 bits. So width 64. Okay, that's what we need to do for a constructor. Okay, so that means so basically uh, for a cache hierarchy, the only things you need to define are what's your memory side port, what's your CPU side port, and how do we incorporate this cache into the board. Thankfully, in this example, what your mem side port is is quite straightforward. Your mem side port is uh, return, oops, return self dot mem bus dot mem side. Is it mem side ports? Sorry, I'm just going to look at it. Yeah, mem side ports. And here, our CPU side is return self dot mem bus dot CPU side ports. So that's our first two uh, abstract functions completely with a concrete implementation. So, second thing we want to, so what we're going to do here, sorry, I just want to make sure I'm going to do this right. Yeah, so what we're going to do here is create, wh what we're creating here is a simple private L1 cache. Okay, so it's pretty straightforward. So what we need for a private L1 cache is to have an L1 cache to put, a private L1 cache cache hierarchy needs L1 caches. So I have to the liberty of creating this file here, the L1 cache, which inherits from the cache sim object, okay? I'm going to do a quite a lot on this slide. There's a couple of things I want to get across here. Um, when you inherit from a sim object, there's some special things you need to consider. Um, sim object variables are kind of special and you can only, you can only set sim object variables inside a sim object. So uh, while I can do stuff like this, which I'm going to, self dot size equals uh, whatever, 32 k bytes, because that is a member of the cache sim object. I can't do stuff like this, self dot Bobby's unique param. I can't do stuff like that. Gem five will get confused. You can only set uh, parameters that are set that are within the cache sim object. If you want to do your own unique parameters, you have to do an underscore beforehand. That's just because we probably covered this at the start. Gem5, in a sense, is a Python interpreter. That's how it reads your configuration file. And when it sees a sim object with a parameter set without a leading underscore, it assumes it's a sim object parameter that is being set. That's a bit confusing, I admit. I wish, there was an, I wish that wasn't, it wasn't that way. That's the case. So if you look into the cache source code, you will see that there's these parameters that can be set and you can only set these parameters. So, First thing we want to do here is super dot underscore underscore init underscore underscore thing. We just we have to always remember in Gen Five to uh, construct our super classes. And then we've already done the size here, but let's set it to some. No, nah, let's set it to, sorry, not twenty. Let's set it to thirty-two. And we can keep my unique parameter here just to show that everything still works even when it's still included. Uh, you want to set the associativity of this class. So self 
got a source, there's eight. We do. And then there's other parameters here. I'm just going to reel off tag latency. Let's set that to one. Data latency, set the one. Self dot response latency. Let's set that to one as well. Self dot mhrs, set that to sixteen. Oh, that's not what I meant to type. Sixteen. We're almost there. So a lot of there's classes has a lot of parameters need to be declared. Uh, the ta TGTS per MHRS equals twenty eight. Self write back clean. Ugh, God, sorry, I'm typing like typing like a maniac today. Right back, clean equals true, and finally self dot prefetcher stride prefetcher. Oh, struct. So yeah, that's a lot of annoyingly large amount of parameters to type up. But that's what you do when you uh, instance, when you inherit from a sim object inside your design. You set the parameters and yeah. So we're saying these are the properties of an L1 cache. Yeah, question? So, sorry, hi. It, it is, well, I mean, you, oh, no. Um, no, it's not. Uh, I didn't. I I don't need a constructor in this, do I? Okay. Oh wait, yeah, I did miss the constructor. Thank you. Yes, I was wondering what I was doing wrong. Def. Oh yeah. Sorry. Yes, I got confused. Um, it's real. This font inside of me is super tiny, and I'm kind of copying from it, so I'm having to squint quite a bit. Um, and then it just pushes up. So yeah, sorry. That probably made, that is, this example probably makes a lot more sense to you now. I am um, inheriting from the cache, and you just clear all this in the constructor. So when we construct the L1 cache, all these parameters are set for us. As you can, yeah? Sorry. That's right. This one? Yeah. This, is the, this is just initializing the super class. This one? Oh, I don't really know. I haven't bothered to look this up. I'm not a cache guy. Yeah, it's a parameter of the cache. Uh, you can look into the cache sim object in the source and see what this parameter means. Um, I just copied this list of some sensible defaults. Yeah? Uh, shouldn't it be kind of a jar, you know, like inside of the Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, MHSR. Uh, sorry, I was. MSHRS. That? Yeah. Okay, yes, that makes more sense. Yeah. S? A trailing S? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I know to it. Okay. That. Uh, okay. Um. I had this as a complete example, but I was asked to remove the, <laughs> uh, to make this, to show how you instantiate a sim object. So this is how we instantiate it. You take your sim object, 
and you wrap it in a subclass and you declare all the parameters you, you, will, need, you, will, need to, you will need to declare and that's how you create your sim object inside the standard library. Um, I wish I could tell you all these parameters mean but I really don't know exactly. You can look in the source and see how this sim object is constructed. So we've defined our L1 cache and I just hope, I just want to say this because this might help in the future, like you don't need to declare all these parameters straight away. You could do something like size and then set this to, you could do something like size here. And, you know, that works. Like it just means that when you construct this, you're going to have to declare the size each time. I just think it's easier for this example that we don't do that. But you know, you're free to do so. It's not, no one's going to stop you. So to get back to our design, next thing we're going to do is incorporate the cache into the board. This is by far the most complex function inside creating your synops for creating There's some stuff here that just kind of needs, is almost boilerplate-y, but you still need to do it. So first thing we're going to do is do board.connect system port uh, and then self.membus membus CPU side ports. So the board has a system side port and you need to connect to it. It's just a requirement for this design. And then we want to set some, then we want to, um, sorry. Then we want to, uh, what are we doing here? Then we want, the, the board also has memory controllers we need to connect to. So we're going to do for controller in board dot get memory, memory dot get memory controllers. We're doing controller dot port. We're connecting each of these memory controller ports to the membus mem side port. Mem side port. Okay, now we want to Create our uh, i caches. So we're going to self dot l1 i caches equals. It's going to be an array. So I like to do it this way. Uh, l1 cache. That's l1 cache we just created. For i in range. So you can see what I'm doing here, that for every single core in our system, we're creating one L1 iCache. Makes sense? Every core has an iCache and a dcache. And then self.l1 dcache. Exactly the same thing. Create a cache for i in range board dot get processor get num cores okay so we've kind of created everything we need broadly speaking we've created our caches now we just have to connect them into our system so I do for i CPU in enumerate board dot get processor get cores. So all this is is every single loop we're getting the the core, which I've called CPU in this instance, 
and it's indexed inside the core array. So I do cpu.connect underscore iCache. I do self L1 I caches I CPU side. CPU dot connect dcache self dot L1 D caches I dot CPU side. So we've connected our caches to the CPU. Now we're going to connect the other side of the CPU to the MEM bus. So at self dot L1 L1 I caches I dot MEM side equals self dot MEM bus dot CPU side. Ports self dot L1 D caches I mem side equals self dot mem bus CPU side ports. And finally, you know, we're almost done. We just need to handle the interrupt ports. You actually will need to do this for x86 for some reason. So int quest port equals self dot member int request with response port. CPU side ports. Finally, CPU connect interrupt. So that's it. You've created a private L1 cache hierarchy setup. Um, I'll give you a moment to get up to speed with that. Does anyone have any questions or need to go back over something? I felt like I went over that a little bit haphazardly. Again, there is an already pre-built example provided if you're really not really need to look back at this. Um, I'll turn back briefly to the slide. Oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I, I, I'm right next to so many fans. What do you think? Uh, I don't. Okay, uh, when, you're, when you're done with that, I uh, don't expect you all to be done, but try putting this into your hello world example that you built right at the start of this class. So you had a private L1, L2 cache. Try, inc try including and incorporating this unique cache hierarchy you just built. Try importing it and using it inside your simulation. If it runs and you get a hello world at the end, you've done it. You've used your component inside your design. Um, yeah, sorry, did you have a question? Sure. 
Sure. Um, I'm going to. I mean, I requested that I go over the incorporate cash again. I'm happy to do so. So I'll go back. Uh, just for those of you who finished and confident that you've written up everything correctly, just sort of put it in your Hello World design. See how it goes. Um, it's just a standard Python import. So. Uh, so, incorporate cache. First line here is kind of a take our word for it. You need to connect to the system port. So you need to connect the membus. Oops, that should that shouldn't be like that. It should be membus dot CPU side ports. Um, is um, you need to also set the uh, memory controllers to the membus. So these first two lines are the most uh, most kind of most slightly counterintuitive ones, but um, the memory controllers need to need to be connected to the membus. Just kind of take our word for it. So these ones here are generating our L, L1i caches and L1d caches. So the first line here is creating our L1i caches. So for each core inside the CPU, we're creating an L1 cache. And for each core, we're creating another, and then similar story for the D caches. Then we go through each core in the board, each CPU. I should have said core here, but I said CPU, so let's just roll with it. For each CPU in the board, you connect the I cache, which just has a function. Then you connect the D cache, which again has a function. So the D, the, these are just, you know, um, in a CPU core, there's just two ports, one that's for D cache, one that's for I, I cache, and you can connect them up. Here we set our I caches to connect to the MEM bus. And here we set our D caches to be connected to the MEM bus. I should be clear that the way the Gem5 Python interprets this isn't standard. The way it's going to read this is as a connection, not necessarily a, yeah, a standard assignment. Yeah. Um, and then here we just have some, again, some kind of boilerplate code, which is, um, connecting the interrupt ports correctly, which is just necessary for x86 systems. Half hour. I'm going to get into your own cash hierarchy. Um, that's what they're, I think that's what I've got. Yeah. A shared, I got something like that, yeah. Or maybe it's a shared, up. well, we'll see. They, they could easily extrapolate it. I'd say you have permission to do whatever you want, but this is what I suggest. Has anyone incorporated this into our Hello World? Can anyone raise your hands if you have and it was successful? Okay, two, two people have, and they're smiling. So, like, uh, but don't, don't worry, uh, there's not much going to happen for the rest of the session. Though, for people who have to get into incorporating into Hello World, I will. Uh, slide up. Your, like, open ended task for the rest of the day is create your own cache hierarchy system and incorporate it into Gen 5. I would suggest, uh, why don't you do a private L1 shared L2 cache hierarchy? Um, someone suggests, can, can we do a uh, three level? Go ahead, knock yourself out. I give you complete creativity in this because I'm, there's nothing else that really comes after this. Um, that's my basic diagram of what a private L1 shared L2 looks like. Um, I feel a little bit helpful here that you might want to import this sim object to use. Um, also, uh, looking into the source in the Gem5 standard library can be really helpful. You see how other ones are designed and work from there. Um, and there's a working example inside completes of this one at least. So if you want to take this, expand it, do whatever you want, get to grips, go ahead. 
But everyone seems to be at slightly different points, so I'm just going to leave you all to work your own pace. Uh, you know what I roughly what you all to do. Did you have a question? Okay.